Today with us on the podcast, we have Freeman Lin. You may know him from uh, Instagram. He is Watch Me Make on Instagram. Just jam all those words together and you'll get uh, Watch Me Make. Um, and uh, he he has been doing some really incredibly amazing stuff. Uh, and he's been putting it up on Instagram. He's been making uh, the world's uh, cheapest uh, 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 panoramic uh, camera, uh, you know, x knockoff. <laughs> um, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think it is true. Uh, it depends. I guess it depends on your donor cameras on that and more about that as we come along. Uh, he's been talking about um, modifying lenses and we just wanted to get him on today and uh, talk about what he does. Uh, and what, um, you know, uh, what, what kind of photography stuff, uh, floats his boat so, uh, we can talk to him. So Freeman, welcome to the show. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Um, we want to, um, uh, start off, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, tell us about your life. Tell us about, um, uh, you know, where you, where you uh, got into photography, what the, um, you know, what the impetus for what you do is. Sounds good. So I'm in uh, Canada, in Calgary. And uh, in terms of photography, I started photography, I think, as most people did. Uh, I bought a digital camera to go take pictures while I'm traveling. And uh, I always liked the cool analog looking cameras. So um you know, when I started, I had a, a D3100 from Nikon, but I really coveted one of the, you know, the Fujifilm offerings. So eventually I ended up upgrading to a X-Pro1 for traveling. And long story short, uh, I went on a big trip to Europe and I think about halfway to three quarters of the way into the trip, I had taken over 3000 photos. And I just felt like, okay, am I ever going to be able to go through it and actually do anything with these photos? Or am I just too overwhelmed to even look at it? So when I was in Budapest, um, there was a quite a few used camera stores there. And I just went in one one day and took a look at it. Didn't even know how to load film at the time. It was pretty embarrassing, had to get the guy to help me. But I picked up a uh, Minolta SRT. It was the 301B, I think, which is like the European version, I think, of like the... I, I can't tell the difference one SRT from another. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's just it was an SRT. And I'm sure there's yeah. some Minolta person who's throwing daggers at me. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't... I never quite understood why they have all sorts of naming convention differences for different regions, but I suppose there's some reason for that. Anyways, I got that film camera and I picked up two rolls of film. I think it was just called that color and uh, I shot them in Italy. And to be honest, when I got back home, I developed them at a local lab and there were way more pictures I felt connected to from those two rows, those, you know, 32 or 36 frames each, so 72 frames, than I did for most of my other digital shots. So from that point on, I started to get into film photography, if you will. And uh, if you look at what I like to take pictures of, traveling, definitely. I think I don't really feel that comfortable to doing street photography, but I do really enjoy taking pictures of um, architecture, symmetry, any sort of um, kind of minimalistic black and white, you know, high contrast photos. So I do re really enjoy that. And so, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> well, so um, from your photos, I see like, you know, like the minimalist architecture stuff. Um, even, you know, before I see your camera builds, I think engineer, uh, let, let's back it up a minute from, from cameras. Uh, sure. Freeman, what, what do you, where in the world do you live and what do you do for a living? Yeah, for sure. So I'm in Canada. I'm in Calgary, Alberta. Most people 
uh, think of Banff and the mountains, which is you know an hour, an hour and a half away, which is really nice. I'm an engineer by training and by profession. So uh, I do work a lot with machinery and uh, design and maintenance of large equipment. I actually work for a oil and gas company. Um, so a lot of large machinery there. But in terms of hobbies, I've always loved to, to tinker and make. And I think there's a lot of parallels with other uh, guests you guys had on the podcast. Um, being in a condo here, this is my bedroom or not my actual bedroom, but one of the bedrooms, uh, I have limited space. So I wanna be able to work on things that are fairly small and I love to work with metals. So watchmaking is actually what I started in, in terms of hobbies, but not seriously into actually manufacturing my own movements, but more in terms of um, making custom watches from parts and modifications etc so i was really into trying to learn how to use like these micro lathes and mills right so that's how i got started and acquired the equipment and when i got into photography and film photography i started i guess gear acquisition syndrome is the big word here i really started getting into like oh okay what's the next camera what what do i want and eventually I did venture down into Leica territory and I do love the bodies, you know, as an engineer, the bodies are well built and they're incredibly solid feeling. They're smooth, but I really don't want to pay the money for all the expensive lenses. That kind of took me down the route of, okay, I like the bodies. I don't want to pay for expensive lenses. What can I do to make my own lenses that work? And I started looking at, okay, point and shoots are probably the easiest, right? So I can take lenses out of those bodies, make a fixed focus mount for them and try them out. That worked great. Uh, I started going to all the thrift shop around the area looking for, you know, these uh, Canon shore shots, especially the, the owl with the large viewfinder, right? I think a lot of people have done that and uh, started working on making point and shoe lenses, which to be honest is really fun for me because you have a very expensive camera, but you know. Oh, Graham, Graham you're muted. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Um, we're, we're, so you're taking the lens from the uh, point and shoot camera and mounting it onto uh, a mount uh, an M mount essentially, uh, and putting it on your, your, uh, Leica, we're going that direction. Yeah. Or, yeah. So, yeah. so, you know, I'm a pretty practical person. I don't want to machine everything myself. So I just looked at, okay, what's the easiest way to do it? Uh, a lot of people use a, a lens cap, right? Modify that to, to make a mount. Mm -hmm. I kind of wanted it to look well-made and metal. So what I did was essentially make an adapter plate out of a piece of uh, aluminum. And then I would epoxy a M mount to a uh, thread mount adapter onto the back of it. So, you know, when you look from the front, it looks all metal, but really it's got some glue holding everything together, but it worked really well. So I continue to use that method, mostly because to machine an M mount itself, is very tedious. Um, I know I can do it. I've done it once, but I don't want to do it over and over again. And unfortunately, my lathe I have is a um, it's a tag lathe, and it doesn't have a threading attachment. So, you know, if I could do a LTM thread, I would just thread the adapter on. But unfortunately, that capability is not there, so I end up using a lot of uh, epoxy still in some of my builds. Cool. Um, we, in fact, actually, you were talking maybe uh, on Instagram maybe a couple weeks ago uh, about adapting. I think it was uh, Konica uh, 35, C35, Konica C, whatever uh, lens um, uh, to to the M mount. So you're 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 at the point where this is something that you can 
uh, hit every time. Am, am I right on that? Or, or what's the, you know, are you doing a lot of these adaptions? Adaptations? Adaptations? So, yeah, yeah I don't think that's, yeah. <laughs> So some of the more complicated uh, conversions or whatever you want to call it, I, I started to work on getting more functionalities back to the end mount, right? So for the for the big one, you know, first aperture, right? Once you have aperture, you have more options in terms of your lighting conditions. Focus would be really good if you can retain it. Although on a lot of the point and shoot cameras, the, the helicoid is basically you know, a ramp. So it's hard to use it exactly. So you got to start going up in terms of the, I, I guess, the complexity of your um, donor camera. So what I started with uh, was actually the Roly uh, XF35, which has a cool sonar lens. I, I, I can't really speak for the actual lens formula there, but it sounded great, so I really wanted to be able to adapt that, and I haven't really seen uh, it done anywhere. So yeah, here's here's a hint: get the Voigtlander version, the Voigtlander V135F, I think it is, uh, yes. and or VF135, um, same lens, exactly the same lens, and it uh, you know it's it's an f2.3, which is an odd lens, and they are half the price of um the rollies because because they're void landers right surprisingly i have a really hard time finding the void landers i have okay. four of the rollies and one of the volt lander and the volt lander is actually better built um not okay. something that's very obvious but all the rollies have plastic filter threads on the front, whereas the Volander actually has aluminum. So it's a lot more robust feeling when you're working on it because some of the rolly ones I have, the filter threat gets damaged because that's where you know people tend to drop things. Sure. So, uh, so I started working on that and I never seen it done. I started looking on the internet and people have been using it adapted to mirrorless digitals, which is a lot easier because you have way more space to work with. Um, but if you look at the actual flange distance with the Roly, it's basically right butted against the, you know, the flange of your normal Leica camera. So like 21 and a half millimeters. Yeah, it's, it's very close. I think you, you get maybe a millimeter and a bit of, of space. So let me just grab that lens. So let's see here. This is my M2 that uh, has been reskinned, and, and and before you before you continue on that, um, uh, just to let everybody who's listening on the podcast know, um, we have this also on YouTube. It is our YouTube channel, which is Homemade Camera Podcast YouTube channel. So uh, he's going to show something, but um, uh, we'll we'll talk about it as well. Sorry. All Go right. Ahead. I'll. I'll have to remember to be as descriptive as possible. So yeah. in front of me is my um, M2. It's a standard M2. It's been serviced and uh, reskinned. And in front of it, it's a strange lens. It's a mix mash of a Volander uh, VF135 body, but with the faceplate and the lens group out of a Roly. Um, uh -huh. I just did that for fun. I also wanted it to be silver, and the Voltlanders are silver versus the black of the um, the Roly. So and, that's what I did. And there. you wanted it, and you wanted a sonar rather than a scopar, right? Uh, because... <laughs> <laughs> that is that is true. That is true. The sonar yeah. <laughs> definitely um, definitely swayed this build for sure. So if you look at the build itself, um, the lens is pretty much removed as is with some removal of things like the, um, you know, the photo cell for the light meter. And because most of these old cameras um, have kind of a combination shutter slash aperture, it's usually part of the body. So when you remove the lens, you lose both the shutter 
as well as the aperture. So the first thing I wanted to do is to see how can I get the aperture back into it. And I started looking up, you know, different people's build, and I realized that you can get these irises for microscopes um, from eBay from China for relatively inexpensive, usually around, I guess, 15 US dollars. Some are cheaper, some are a lot more expensive, depending on the size and I guess how um, complicated it is. So I found a 13 millimeter iris that was approximately the, you know, the opening size of an F2.3 uh, element. And I started working on how can I make this thing fit inside between the lens group and the shutter. And it was a lot of kind of just sketching on paper, trying to see, okay, does the dimensions make sense? Can I get enough clearance? Um, you got to take into account the fact that the whole lens group move in and out. So you want to really design everything for infinity focus where your flange distance is the shortest. And eventually I managed to come up with a way to do that. And now I had, you know, a nice perfectly circular 10 blade aperture. And then uh, before you continue, wants, um, right? yeah, uh, before you continue, I just uh, have the question. Can you not just jam the shutter open, leave it open and leave the aperture um, uh, function, the, you know, and let the aperture function independently? Um, what is it about removing that that you needed to do? Well, I think oh, this yeah. lens so, didn't necessarily come with a manual aperture in it in the first place, did it? That's right. Yeah, it's a auto. Uh, I guess it's a. Is that considered aperture priority? Mm. Well, it's oh, probably yeah. like a combined um, aperture and shutter, where the shutter only yeah, opens uh -huh. to a certain size, which you probably have to pull the whole thing off of the lens to remove the lens from the body. Okay. Yeah, so for this particular lens, the it is a combination uh, shutter and aperture, and it's actually in the body. So when you remove the lens, it doesn't come with it. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, I was just thinking because uh, if I remember correctly, I don't remember whether it's the the Roly or the Voigtlander that has the um, one of them has markings for um like a flash uh a flash yeah. indicator and the other one has markings uh what we would know is just normal f stops on a on an, uh an aperture um so i yeah i don't remember which one is which but uh yeah yeah i think they're they're like guide numbers right so on the guide yeah uh, boat lander you you can't see on the bottom there are these uh numbers on the ring which is really designed just for that. It's for manual control of the um, in-body aperture, if you will. It, it kind of just moves, uh, I guess, a, a little stop arm, which limits how big the shutter opens, right, when you actuate it. So it is a convenient ring to have because it has a little locking tab on it, but once you deactivate it by basically removing the spring and gluing it in place, it rotates, you know, maybe 180 degrees. I'm sure you can modify it to rotate it further, which is uh, what you have to do in this modification. So once you have that um, aperture unit, it, it has a little arm on it. So I just basically made by cutting a tiny, tiny piece of brass, a little, um, I guess, arm to hook onto the linkage and move with the ring. And then the rest is just trying to figure out, okay, what is F2.3? What is F4? What is F8, et cetera. And because this is already a pretty compact camera, I didn't mark all the apertures. So as you can see here, I have some color markings on that ring. And I, I just marked it for F16, F8, F4, and maximum aperture. Because I, I figured if Sunny 16 is not cutting it, I'm probably gonna be shooting mostly at max aperture anyways when I'm inside. So um, the minimum markings makes it just a little bit easier to, to play with. So, okay, so this, this seems to me like, um, you know, uh, for only seven or $8,000 worth of work, you have managed to make 
a fairly inexpensive lens for your Leica, um, which which tells me like you got a bad case of camera beaties. Like you you can't help yourself. Uh, no matter no matter what the uh, you know logic to it is, um, and I, I really identify that with that and uh, really appreciate it. I wonder taking it back again because everybody wants to talk about your cameras, and I want to find out a little bit more about you before we get going. Um, what other what other things? I mean, it it sounds like you know in adulthood you were into making watches, but as a kid, were were you the type of kid that took things apart constantly, uh, annoyed your parents by breaking VCRs type of thing. Uh, what other things have you not been able to help yourself but build uh, in the last, you know, forever? <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, Lego definitely was my gateway drug, if you will. But um, as soon as you are no longer cool playing Lego, I definitely started doing things like building uh, little remote control cars and, and airplanes, mostly off um, plans, right? Um, do it yourself, making it out of like the the corrugated plastics. And I did take apart a, a lot of things. Um, thankfully, none, nothing that was already functional. I would kind of do uh, dumpster diving, if you will, right? If you find some cool electronics or computers, you just get a screwdriver and spend the afternoon taking it apart, not really knowing what to do with it, but see what's in there, see how things are set up and uh, take apart a few things that you feel like, oh, maybe I can use that one day for something else. That's uh, that's definitely a hobby. And um, university, uh, most of my projects were uh, working around how to impress people with Arduino. So um, we have this kind of a, pseudo science fair at uh, the university I went to where you can submit your projects. And um, most of my projects were around alcohol. And uh, so when I was in university, I designed essentially a dispensing robot, right? That would allow you to connect multiple bottles of whatever liquid you want. And you can set it up to dispense certain volumes into the same shot glass to mix your own drinks. And um, that was a lot of fun, but as you can tell, like that that kind of project basically meant I was in my room coding until you know two or three in the morning trying to get things working, and uh, occasionally going to the shop to cut some acrylic or Lexant for the bodies of the the build and such. Did you build your own peristaltic pumps with NEMA stepper motors? I wish it was, uh, it was actually pretty, um, it was a pretty bad design. It's actually gravity fed. So it's based on kind of a pinch tube design. So, um, the, mo the volumetric like, control is pretty, uh, it's pretty rough. Timed, uh, timed solenoid valves. That's right. Yeah. It was a, it was a servo set up to basically pinch pinch the tube and um so as you know like as your container volume drops you get less pressure so <laughs> it so does not work that well at the end for work i have built some uh like brewery canning equipment um also jeff perry from 20th century camera has i think he, we were talking about the jevo which was a jello shot dispensing machine i think there's more than a few camera makers who have either dabbled or professionally worked in alcohol dispensing and monitoring and brewing machines. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a gateway drug. Uh, it goes straight to cameras. You, you, you have hard liquor pouring, you have cameras. It just, oh, so it's terrible. Actually, the last time I worked on a liquid dispensing machine was also that that sort of simple um, solenoid valve with a gravity reservoir to drop droplets in front of a laser to photograph drops hitting a surface for a physicist friend of mine. Uh, but I, I actually combined the two in, in a really terrible project, but we, we got some uh, pictures of coronal ejections. Uh, we did not find the geometry we were looking for though. For science, that's really cool. <laughs> It was medium cool at best, but okay. I, I think like all of these things I really identify with from like 
Legos to, you know, I don't know why every science fair project is actually an engineering fair project, but like in second or third grade, I definitely uh, won the chess set that I still have uh, with a half Lego, half scrap electronics, <laughs> electric car. <laughs> and then uh, I kind of moved to taking apart junk electronics the, on the street. I think the cool factor is what is really important for a lot of these science fairs, right? Because, uh, you know, who wants to see a robot uh, try to deliver you a can of beer, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that that's kind of the progression, if you will. And uh, going back to the lens I was talking about, I think the holy grail with any sort of Leica conversion is to get the rangefinder coupling, right? So once I had the aperture figured out, the rangefinder coupling was basically where I spent all my attention on. I didn't really know how it was going to fit, but I know that you know you can look at a a Volander lens and kind of try to disassemble it in your mind, right? And and see, okay, this part needs to rotate. Well, this part needs to stay stationary. Can I achieve the same thing on this lens? And I think by luck, this lens does have enough space as well as the right, um, I guess, um, geometries to allow you to attach a cam to the focus ring. And that cam, if you give it enough room to poke out the backside, will actually engage with the um, rangefinder roller um, on the Leica. So when that was done, I was like, okay, great. Let's make this out of brass, right? <laughs> so I, I had limited experience with machining with brass especially a complicated shape that requires, you know, a cam profile. So um, I started it and immediately realized, okay, this is not going to be very easy and I'm going to waste a lot of time trying to get this profile. So I thought, okay, well, I have a 3D printer. This is actually before I used the 3D printer for any camera projects. And I thought, okay, maybe I should try to design it on a CAD software. I use SolidWorks and see how precise I can build something that's relatively small, right? And of course I knew it wasn't gonna be perfect. So I usually design things with a little bit of margin so that I can do some final filing, right? With a small needle file. So I started printing it and it actually, it actually looks okay. Like the CAD profile looks to be strong enough. And because this is such a small lens where I'm not going to be focusing it all the time. A lot of the time, I think I'm just going to be setting it to a hyperfocal distance and using it. I don't think a wear and tear on this little piece of plastic is going to be a huge issue. And, you know, the Leicas do have a roller, so the friction is not so high. And, um, you know, with some time and some iterations of the model, eventually I was able to get a profile that it, that basically couples perfectly once you smooth out the little steps from the printing process. And with that, I think this is pretty much the first of its kind, if you will. And because I have the files, I figured, okay, well, should I make a few more and, and try to share with other people and also try to, you know, recoup some of the <laughs> hours I spent working on this and uh, start looking at how to get more of these um, Roly lenses online. And unfortunately, being in Canada, I'm pretty limited in terms of my local you know, used camera resources. So most of my stuff is from eBay or somewhere else online. And uh, it can get pretty expensive when you add in all the shipping. So a lot of the parts come very slowly. I don't go out and, you know, try to massive source a lot of things. Just, uh, hey, if it comes up, it comes up. And because of that, my project can to meander from one camera to the other, depending on what, what's available. Okay, for those of you who are not watching at home, but you're driving or you're out in the yard or you're um, hiding away from your kids, um, I have in my hands an uh, Kanaka Auto Reflex TC that I reskinned horribly 
with a piece of leather that was way too thick. But um, it looks like human the, the, skin. Ugh. Yes, uh, <laughs> this is the Ed Gein version, right? Um, so uh, the um, uh, this this camera, this Auto TC, it has a problem. It, its second curtain is slow. Um, uh, so I'll you know it it'll open fine, but. The closing is just, you know, like when it wants to, it'll close. So I have seen you take a different Kanaka, and um, uh, I have seen you cut it in half, and then I've seen you take another Kanaka and cut it in half and put them together and make an X-Pan. So, um, or an X-Pan um, sized yeah camera and it, you put um what a four by five lens on there something like that or or, yeah, or what, what lens a four by five, yeah. four by five yeah. lens will work um, medium format lenses most of them will, will cover that as well okay so we have a we have the term of course uh franken camera um there is no more franken camera than i think of cutting apart two cameras making the film gate wider and then putting them back together in such a way that it then works. And I, I, I want to hear about your, your, uh, uh, it's not alchemy, but whatever it is that, that, um, engineering, engineering, <laughs> that's the word it is. No, engineering, no, no. It's the surgery. magic. It's surgery. surgery. Yeah. Yeah. Camera surgery for sure. So, so Graham, um, I gotta say, I, did not have an original idea at the beginning. So this is kind of at the beginning of um, COVID lockdown and I was just browsing and I'm part of a few different um, camera groups on Facebook. And this guy in uh, Europe, his name is Wilco Jensen. He posted his X-Pan build, which he used a Schneider um, super angle on 47 millimeter with a Nikon FE body. And I think he is a Hasselblad um, certified repair person. And so he had a lot of good parts. He made it out of metal. And I was getting a little bored because I've been home all the time and I wanted a project. And from years of you know collecting film cameras, I've broken a few. So I had an SE body that was not working. Um, long story short, I used some cheap coin cell batteries and they basically exploded and broke the electrical contacts inside the camera, which if you want to replace, you actually have to basically remove the mirror box and, um, you know, everything else to access it. So I deemed that to be a difficult repair. That's not worth the time. So I said, okay, I have a body. I don't have a lens. Let's let's see what I can do, right? I, I feel pretty confident working on these things just because it's a hobby and I can take as long as I want. So I went on eBay and actually found uh, one of these super angle ons for for pretty good price. You know, I think it was about like 250 US dollars, which, you know, if I can get it on eBay, that's already a, a blessing, if you will, because locally I'll never be able to find something like this. Right. So anyways, because Woko posted on Facebook kind of the layout, right? How he basically enlarged the um, the opening for the film. It looked to be a pretty simple modification if you have the right tools. Now, I think you can probably do it with a like a jeweler saw, but I had a little mini Sherline mill here. So it's a lot easier for me to just chuck it up, index it, and then machine it. So if you look at it, I have the camera in front of me here. Um, it's a black FE body. And all I did was take apart everything but the film transport and remove the top prism by cutting it with a Dremel. And then once I get to the inside, as you can see, it's essentially just trying to maximize the available space in here and cutting all the metal out between the two film rails. And okay, so he's just, um, for our listeners, he's just opened this camera up and it looks to me like 
it's supposed to be that way. Um, I'm not seeing any seams. Like I, the film rail looks like right, it's the, perfectly smooth. The that film way. rails are the same length as the original. It's just That's right. uh, the original had the film gate. Uh, the opening oh, of the film okay. gate was the size of one frame. But if you take out you know, a bunch of the baffling and the mirror and all of the mechanism around the mirror uh, and then cut the film gate open, right? You, you have film rails that extend uh, long enough for it, I believe. So, yes, yeah, so, yeah, Graham, so... This, is, this is not two cameras grafted together. This is a Nikon oh. FV with an enlarged film gate. Okay, right. so, yeah. well, stupid me. Um, I, where, where did I think that you had two cameras that you were... You were, we, can, um, we can go to uh, that next. <laughs> okay. We can go to so that one next. I, I didn't but... dream. I didn't dream that then. <laughs> no, okay. no, you're good, Graham. That's okay. Well, because it was going to go in my camera dream journal if I dreamt it. <laughs> but yeah, okay. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Continue on. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm looking at mine. Uh, and yeah. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, I mentioned that there's some luck to it starting off basically building off someone else's design is that the FE is one of the better bodies for this conversion, right? Because you want to achieve X pan look, you want to at least 65 millimeter wide um, frames, but most bodies don't allow you to do that very um, effectively. And there's really two big factors. One is, do you have the actual physical space, right? Between the, um, the take up reel. As For well listeners as at home, edit. Graham has his calipers out and is measuring <laughs> the back of his camera. <laughs> so, so you want that to be at least, you know, 68 to give you a little bit of room for air as well as to make sure you don't accidentally cut into a part that will light, um, light leaks through. The other thing, which is really uh, camera specific is your pressure plate on the film door. You want to make sure that it's actually wide enough to give you good pressure along the whole width of that 65 millimeter frame. And you want to make sure that it's actually positioned to cover that area. So for the FE, if you look at it, I'm, I'm just showing you a side view of it. The pressure plate basically covers the maximum amount of opening you can achieve on um, the body. So it makes for a pretty solid candidate for conversion. Now, on the other hand, I have here in front of me, this is a Canon FTB, and it's also been modified to remove the material from inside. But as you can see, the pressure plate doesn't quite cover the whole width. There's a section here missing. And, you know, you are probably okay with that but anytime you don't have perfect flatness you're going to have a little bit of loss of resolution perhaps and even worse you could have light leaks if you know it doesn't transport smoothly so you have to be more careful if you're using a body that doesn't have the perfect setup um, i'm probably going to eventually convert this canon ftt uh, b body but it, it's going to be a high risk right and also Keep in mind that this is one of the bodies with their quick load system, which complicated things because it puts a lot more pressure on the take up reel. And what that does with this setup is it causes the film to kind of curl a bit. And I think that will probably exacerbate any issues you have with um, film flatness. So in terms of my search for bodies, FE was great because I had one and I, I was able to find others but they're getting harder and harder to get locally. So to source it, I would have to go on eBay. And I decided, okay, let's see if I can find other bodies that were just as good and hopefully a little bit cheaper. So in that search, I found that the Konica Auto Reflex, uh, which I'm holding here, one of the older A versions, they have probably the best body for panoramic conversions out there. First of all, it's a larger body. Um, I find that metal shutters often give you way better room to work with than cloth shutters. So that's something to consider, but not always the case. But more importantly, it has the biggest pressure plate of any camera, 
it's literally wider than you even need it. And uh, I'm just showing it here. You can cut a 72 millimeter wide opening with ease on the auto reflex. So Graham, the, you have the, the, the TC version, right? So the, yeah, I have compact. the TC. Yeah, it's got a 68 millimeter uh, pressure plate. Uh, Although and it looks it's to me not like necessarily centered on that camera is yeah. part of the issue. So not all of it is usable. Oh, right. well, but I highly yeah. recommend that you cut that thing in half. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we can get to that. That's always an option. And sometimes that option um, presents itself to you because of the challenges <laughs> with the pressure plate. So, yeah, yeah. So I really think this auto reflex the a i think also the the t are probably your your best bet and they're really cheap um, for the most part and um, if you can find a broken version that has a cracked prism or, or damaged light meter whatever it may be it's the ideal candidate it's a little bit bigger so when you compare it with the se you're, you're dealing with some extra bulk and extra height i'm just holding them in front of you for comparison yeah. um which means that you have more room to work with in terms of building your, um, you know, your adaptation. You have more room to put a bigger lens on there. Whereas with the SE, you're pretty much at the limit of what that body can hold, right? You have to use right. kind of a helicoid that's just kind of the right size to and, give you. And I just want to uh, hold up the um, the Konica again. I want to give a shout out to Matt because yeah. he's got a Raveni Labs. Um, uh, a, a meter right okay. there, just like I do here, and uh, and as it says, uh, made in Canada on the side, right? <laughs> uh, actually, oh, I, it's on it's on the side of the box. Of the box. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. a really really compact light meter, and I, yeah. I usually use Sunny sixteen, but when I'm indoors, this meter is really helpful because you're shooting two frames at a time now, so it helps to make sure you have everything metered properly, right? And, uh, and I, so I actually wanted to ask about uh, shooting two frames at a time. Are you modifying the uh, shutter interlock or removing it uh, such that you're winding the right amount of spacing? I assume that the shutter interlock is actually built into the shutter uh, gear train rather than the uh, film spacing or winding gear train. And so it's probably just gone and you can wind as many frames as you want. Or do you retain a counter? Uh, I would assume that you have a counter and you don't have a lockout. So that's a really good question. I'll, I'll share some trade secret, if you will. So I find with most metal uh, curtain shutters, the way it's set up is that you know, your shutter button has a rod that actuates a mechanism on the bottom of the film transport to lock it in place. So as soon as you remove that rod, you can free freewheel it as much as you want, right? And what's really important when you look at these cameras for this kind of conversion is you want it to have a ratcheting mechanism that doesn't allow you to do half strokes, right? So with the Konica, for example, if I stroke it halfway, it holds and you have to finish it for it to return, which is excellent because that means when you do double stroke, you're not likely to do one and a half stroke or you know 1.7 of a stroke. Mm -hmm. Some of the cloth shutters, um, such as like the F2 or the F, it doesn't have that, which means in, in those cases, it might actually be helpful to keep your linkage to the shutter. That way you have to you know advance, press the shutter button, and then advance again to ensure that you have your two stroke required, right? So I do look for that in the advance mechanism. And I find that typically for metal shutters, they have that, so it's great. Um, same with the FE, it's very smooth. You, you know, this is partially stroked, so it has no resistance. And then when you full stroke it, it goes back to the starting point. So I find that to be pretty important to consider. Um, on the cameras like the FTB, you really, you just have to, because it, it returns anywhere. So you really have to do full stroke two times to make sure you advance it properly. Of course, because you're cutting, you know, only a 65 millimeter wide opening, you do have a little bit more room to work with than you normally would. But I think overlapping is definitely still 
uh, a potential problem. Mm-hmm. Now, to avoid that problem, I think what uh, you can do is find one of the old stereo or panoramic cameras or those uh, multiple lens 3D stereo cameras, the NIMS lower such as the NIMSLOW. Exactly. So if you use that, you have perfect frame line spacing because you don't need to modify the film advance to double stroke it. You can single stroke it. And, um, you know, you, you have proper frame counters too, right? With this, you're always basically starting with an even number or starting with an odd number and remembering it and go, okay, I got to stay on the even numbers or I got to stay on the odd numbers. So I think the NIMSLOW is uh, my next kind of body to to modify. And I know the film pressure plate will be good as well because it's designed to cover that area, right? Mm-hmm. And I think there's a, if you guys are looking for bodies, there's a guy in Hong Kong that probably owns or at one point owned some sort of repair shop. And he's putting on eBay like six bodies at a time that are broken. So worth considering if you want to get into that. I. I bought some. I still haven't received it yet, but I'm really excited to see what those bodies will allow me to do. And and so it sounds like you have not coupled the shutter linkage. Um, are you just firing, you know, with the with the lever on the lens? And have you thought about maybe converting sort of the bottom of that shutter rod to pushing something like a cable release and linking that up? I'm, I'm yeah, sure you've thought about a few uh, <laughs> a few possible I've, solutions. I definitely thought about that. Um, you know, in some cameras, I left the linkage in place so that that could be an eventual modification. For the most part, though, I, I shoot with like a wrist strap and I tend to shoot and then put it into my bag. So having some extra cable attachments really impede the way I like to use my cameras, right? Now, of course, if I can make it so that it somehow like threads in and detaches easily, that would be fantastic. I haven't really um, spent as much time on that, right? And also because you have to cock the, you know, the large format lens anyway, separately, I find it just easier to use this hand. So I'm using my FE example here. I'm using my left hand to cock the shutter. And then my thumb is basically right where the shutter button is anyway. So I can just cock and and shoot pretty easily and i find that depending on how you mount it um you know if you're left-handed or right-handed you can find ways to to get that to work for you pretty easily it is more or less a a two-handed camera but uh, i think you can probably do it one-handed if you know if you get creative with it so i i i do particularly like the uh the sunshade on that one it it looks very very hoover-esque or maybe Dyson esque, I don't know. It it uh, it does have that that vacuum cleaner kind of shape, <laughs> um, but it uh, but I I, it, I see it works. It, it's essentially uh, a rectangle that uh, morphs into um, the the cylinder uh, to to thread onto the end of the lens. Yeah, that's right, Graham. It's it's a very simple um, feature on SOLIDWORKS, I guess on Fusion probably as well. It's just a loft from a rectangle to a circle. And um, I think I can probably get more creative with it. I've seen some better designs out there for sure. Um, I do get sometimes really into, okay, let's get this thing finished so I can take pictures with it. So aesthetics become, you know, a lower priority. And if you look at this... I love oh, the aesthetics yeah. on that. That that kind of looks like um, an old, um, you know, uh, cinema camera. You know, it's got that oh, kind yeah. of front end look to it. You know, for me also, like when aesthetics are purely dictated by function, is is my favorite type of aesthetics. Uh, yeah, we we know, that. we know, Monday. we we know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so I I also wanted to ask uh, some more technical questions about the camera sure. if you feel up to answering them. So. It seems like um, probably to remove the prisms and the mirror boxes, you pulled the front lens mount assembly off. Um, And I'm guessing you just tossed it and then replaced it with maybe a 3D printed top plate uh, to go over where the prism is and then built like maybe um, a 3D printed part that matches the bolt pattern of the original, um, original 
lens mount assembly, and then that takes like a N65 helical or something. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, so then you can see this is a Canon example. Once you remove the mirror box, which is what the lens mount is attached to, you basically are left with whatever the original mounting mechanism is, which in this case is just the four. I think these are 1.8 um, millimeter or maybe 1.6 millimeter screws. So they're not very big, but um, I think for the most part, if you're using a, a light enough lens. Plenty strong. That exactly. held the original so, camera together. <laughs> exactly, that's right. Um, so I use the normal mounting positions. Uh, sometimes I have to machine around it to clear any sort of additional mounting points to make sure that there is no um, clash with the larger lens. And then I machine away, or in this case, Dremel away the prism and um, try to get a flush top plate. And that's just because the prism is kind of useless and I want a viewfinder to mount with a low profile, right? Instead of using the, the hot shoot on the original. On some of these cameras though, the top plate are so nice. I, I have a hard time cutting it, you know? With this Canon FTB, for example, I feel like this would be a perfect conversion to build a little light meter in the viewfinder, right? As you can see with the Remini Lab meter, the display is quite small. So you can almost fit that, or I know you can fit that in there. And then you can have a very sleek kind of uh, camera, right? With I mean, you almost have, so, yeah. Um, you must have enough room that you could cut a hole in the front of it and make it a viewfinder. <laughs> that's right, yeah. I thought about that um, as well. For the most part with the Nikons, the prism is not properly lined up with the lens. So I, I guess being you know slick, stickler for details, I want everything to, to line up perfectly. So a top plate is a lot easier. And um, I think it's because it's quite a compact camera to try to make it very flat and small is part of the appeal, right? Mm -hmm. So for the FE, um, I used a custom helicoil, which is off a old Minolta uh, 50 millimeter lens, like a 1.4, I think. Um, I I bought it as a package and it somebody dropped it and the elements destroyed. So I just kept the helicoil thinking one day I'll use it and eventually that day they came. So it, it definitely helps to, to hoard parts, uh, although my girlfriend probably don't agree with that. Uh, so, I feel this you. Is, uh, <laughs> so this is the, the conversion I did. Um, essentially, I machined down the helicoid uh, a little bit to make sure it has the proper flange distance. And then the rest is just a little bit of um, fine tuning of this plate that mounts the large format shutter to the helicoid. Now, for other cameras where you know you're starting from scratch, definitely eBay helicoids are, are fantastic. I think for the super angle on the 47 millimeter, it's got a small enough rear lens um, group that you can use a 42 millimeter helicoid. And then the next step up typically is a 58 millimeter, which is what I use for the next camera we're gonna talk about. Graham, this is for you. <laughs> this is the Nikorama. And uh, when you look at it, you go like, that looks like kind of like a Nikor, um, Nikromat, but it looks a little off in terms of proportions. And the reason for that is it's two Nikromats chopped together and glued together into one. So you can have a extremely wide um, frame in this case it's 110 millimeters so it gives you wow. a nice um i guess what you would call that <laughs> one to mm -hmm. four ratio right um super panel so super panel is correct i have not actually film tested this just because i was recently finishing up all the light sealing um, but now it's finally ready for testing and the story behind this camera is basically I was looking for cheap bodies to make normal conversions and um, some guy was selling a bunch of broken um, necromats and I don't know what happened, but they all had broken front mounts. So essentially the, the actual metal that mounts the, 
the, the flange rings have all cracked for some reason. So somebody either dropped them with a really heavy lens or I don't know what exactly caused it. But anyways, uh, I got that to see if the Nikkor mats make good bodies. And I find that although they are great in terms of having the right amount of material in the body to work with, they don't really have the best pressure plate, right? And because I wanted to see what I can do, I figured, okay, if the pressure plate is not great, why don't I just modify the pressure plate completely? And since I have more than one body, why don't I mix it up and try to make a extremely wide body? And I did it probably the worst way possible. Um, I think most people, they would cut the body in half, right, with a little bit of extra and then just do one joint to connect them together. Well, I cut the wrong body because one of the body actually had a broken um, film advance. So when I cut that body short, I didn't have enough room to make the actual super panel camera. So what I had to do was I have to cut the other camera short and then cut what's remaining of the first camera and make kind of a middle piece to join them together, right? So it is a lot of extra alignment in this case to get all of the three parts. If you can see here, there's kind of two joints holding everything together. So there's a middle piece. And the benefit of that, you know, if you look at it is it does allow me to play around and relocate, for example, the tripod screw. So I have two of them on the bottom. One is the original and one is actually lined up with the axis of the lens, right? So, you know, you make a mistake, you try to live with it and uh, try to play around and see how to get it better. I used a lot of uh, epoxy for this build. A lot of JD Weld is holding this thing together, which, um, I highly recommend, actually. It's a very uh, versatile adhesive. I have, hey, JB, I I have JB Weld uh, keeping pressure in a 300-pound ram weight air hammer. <laughs> it it I, does the job. I was wondering about... Um, so <laughs> it looks like you did a pretty good job uh, getting collinearity in those uh, film transport rails. I wonder if you, so if I were to do it, I would probably solder and then file or braze and then file. I wonder if you did that or you were crazy and welded or just use JB Weld and uh, held it together that way and filed for smoothness. Yeah, the, the, the latter option is what I went down. So I used a tiny straight edge to act as a brace when I did the gluing with the JB weld. And on the other side, I machined essentially um, a stiffener out of a tiny piece of aluminum so that you actually have structural support along the, the camera, right? Otherwise you're, you're gluing very thin pieces together. So uh, you can't really see it anymore because it's all built inside on the other side. But once I did all that, there's still a little bit of unevenness so I took a very thin strip of sandpaper with a, a piece of backing and I just laid it on here and then moved it back and forth on, until there was no more rough edges. So I, I can kind of, I hope anyways, I hope there's no issues with film flatness, but it's still a, a concern in my head. And then of course the pressure plate, if you look at it here, is the two joined together and it's also glued and there's a little piece of brass shim that is used as the backing plate and for the most part when i try to get things really straight uh, i find a nice piece of glass on a, like a glass table and i use that as your support and you just clamp everything onto it that way when you take it off it's as smooth as that glass surface it's the uh, 3d printers machinists table <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, it's my dining table and uh, it's worked pretty well. And hey, um, Freeman, I wonder, um, you're probably a little bit younger than me, but I, I think we're probably in the same generation that, uh, I don't know if you guys were watching this up in Canada. Did you ever watch Pimp My Ride with Exhibit? Mm -hmm. Have you seen the episode have, where yeah. I think it's like a Honda Civic that was actually two cars cobbled together. It was the only episode I ever saw where they just bought the guy a new car. 
<laughs> no, I have not seen that. Oh, I feel like that's your spirit episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I I definitely uh, I definitely like challenges and problem solving. So sometimes, you know, it's basically trying to say, okay, I made a mistake here. Can I correct it? Can I fix it? And a lot of times I find that the mistakes I made end up being, you know, really interesting path and allowed me to build something that probably would not have built, right? I don't think building a super wide format camera was ever on my list of to-dos, but just because I screwed up with machining, uh, it ended up happening. So the thing with this Necorama is that you need a very large amount of coverage. And I didn't want a super long lens in terms of the flange distance. So I try to pick a, something that has, you know, relatively wide angle of view. So in this case, this is a 65 millimeter super angle on. Um, I find that these F8 versions are usually pretty readily available. And uh, even though they're not great for indoor photography, I think if you're taking a lot of landscape shots, they're they're very good and um, they're the most accessible lens if you're getting into these conversions. I think 65 um, medium format is also a really good one. I think you can get the Mamiya Press 65 for relatively um, low dollars, as well as some people such as um, uh, Rod Silva on Instagram has converted the uh, the TLR versions, right? The the Mamiya 65 from their C330. And I think that's yeah, a I've, very good conversion. I've done that. Um, I, I feel bad separating out that lens because, you know, um, uh, C330 is a nice camera. But they're really yeah. decent lenses for, um, for the price that you pay for them. The problem is that, like, I, even, I have a 55 millimeter um, Mamiya C lens, the pro but the problem is that it's got an 80 millimeter flange distance. So right. it it is uh, it it's not as functional maybe as one of the other ones because um, you know it'll cover, uh, but it 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 you know like it covered six by nine um, with absolutely no problem, uh, but it's yeah it it just it, that long flange focal distance became a geometry issue and it, it gave me a camera that I wasn't as thrilled with. Yeah, I find that, you know, longer focal distance, you do need to design your lens cone very carefully to make sure it doesn't have any even adding or, or even worse, you just cut out, right? So it makes it a lot harder in this case to, to cover 110 millimeters. You need to make sure the lens cone is basically similar to that hood, it's, it's a large rectangle mm -hmm. that uh, goes into the circle that is uh, on the helical. And in this case, I have to see if I'm getting any vignetting. I'm sure on the 65 millimeter, there's already some vignetting. So we'll, we'll see how that looks uh, on this camera. I'm pretty excited to try it out. And uh, the only thing that's missing is a proper viewfinder, right? Which is kind of the next segue, if you will, in terms of what am I working on? Um, I find that once you have the cameras built and you want to make it more accessible to other people, the big cost that seems to be excessive is trying to find a nice wide angle viewfinder. I think, and you know, the typical ones I've used, such as the Leica 24 millimeter or the Volander 25 or, or even the 15 millimeter, they're nice viewfinders, but they're over a hundred dollars now i think and the leicas are even even more right so i feel like for this to be something mm -hmm. that someone can build easily um especially if they want to use a real wide angle like a 50 millimeter or the 47 millimeter finding a a good viewfinder and that's not going to break the bank is is uh, the next step right so for the last um few weeks i've been looking for different types of these wide angle lens converters, right? These are kind of the cheap stuff that you would see that would screw on in front of your video camera or even your still frame. Um, what is SLR. your, what, what's your angle of view on that? Um, for a 65 millimeter lens, 
Um, and uh, what is it? 110 millimeter wide. What's your angle of view on that? Oh, I never actually, <laughs> yeah, I never did the uh, calculation, but it's probably. I'll, I'll take a look. Like, like the a, horizontal probably. would be about the same as a 65 on 4x5, right? Because 4x5 is 120 millimeters wide, which is, yeah. it's yeah. extremely wide. It's, I've tried to, the, I mean, some people have requested viewfinders for 65 on 4x5, which I'll make, but you can't see it, you know, in one shot. You're going to have to look left and right through the viewfinder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, by the yeah, way, I just looked it up. That lens has a 128 millimeter image circle, so you should be good uh, for well, not. Well, but the, the vignetting is not caused by the image circle being too small, right? It's, it's caused the by the rays. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, hitting something on the inside, essentially, right? Right, and and that's yeah. why, like yeah. Nick, is always trying to tell me to put uh, other lenses on another helical in the the uh, homunculus or the bronco pan but the issue is often like once you close focus them the helix is actually too small right mm -hmm. and so no matter how yeah. big i build my part of the thing uh even an m65 the helix is so small that at close focus it will start vignetting against the back of the helix and so like when i build uh the og helixes often the cameras will get really really big uh, when people have like wide angle lenses or lenses that have a lot of throw during focus, uh, because, you know, even though I could fit the lens and helix not much bigger than the lens, if at close focus, like in a portrait, I don't want it to be yet, then the helix cup starts getting really, uh, pretty wide. Yeah, that's a definitely a, a challenge. I think, you know, sometimes you can try to counter it by recessing the lens, but then eventually you have the opposite problem of the netting on the front side right so it is it is one of the challenges with using really large um, lenses for these conversions uh what was i thinking about here ah i was going to go back to these viewfinders so i find that if you can get like what's considered a 0.45 or 0.5 magnification lens they're usually pretty good i think they give you an equivalent of almost 20 millimeter um as a viewfinder and I find that to be acceptable for the standard um, X-Pan builds with the 65 millimeter frames. This one is really wide. This is a 0.45. Uh, I think it might be enough coverage for this conversion, but I really don't know. I just actually picked this up two days ago um, at a little flea market thing. And, um, you know, it's basically taking one of these building something that it threads into with a Hashu mount and off you go to test it, right? Uh, I do find that some of these smaller, more compact adapters, they have a lot of distortion and the barrel distortion is, is terrible. So you're, you're not going to get, you know, the perfect framing, but being that it's kind of a huge clunky camera, um, I think I'm going to be doing a lot of bracketing shots anyways if I have something I really want to take. So it's not too bad. Um, going back to I, the type of viewfinder. I have a, I have a suggestion. I just did, uh, I, I went to the pointsinfocus.com that'll give you angle of view and, and uh, uh, focal length equivalent and all that type of stuff. Uh, it looks like um, 65 millimeter on a on 110 millimeter wide um, uh, piece of film is equivalent to about a 24 millimeter. Yeah, I got 24 millimeter on this calculator. Um, so it, it, there is um, the cheapest way to go. It's not going to be completely accurate, but the cheapest way to go is one of those Rico. 28 millimeter viewfinders that, that, you know, that are like 20 bucks on eBay. Um, oh. And it's a, it's an, you know, an accessory shoe viewfinder um, and then mask it off and maybe do some trimming on the edge to maybe get that little extra. I don't know. Whether that'll, I don't know whether that's possible. I haven't done it, but, um, but that may be a way to go for viewfinders on these. That's a really good point, Graham. Uh, I think, Dora Goodman's camera, some of them have these um, wide angle lens converter viewfinders. And to be honest, I think if you're using, for example, here, 
I'm showing the, the press pan, which is a Mamiya press conversion. Because the lens is already so huge, having a large viewfinder actually is quite aesthetically pleasing. And to be honest, I'm using, I don't really know, I think this is a Gemini brand 49 millimeter a wide angle converter. It is the brightest IP mm. out there, right? Because you're literally, it, it, it's barely magnifying. So it almost feel like you're, you're just walking into a, a slightly larger room and the clarity is excellent. The framing is not so good because you can kind of see everything move if your eyes shift a little bit. But in terms of um, a viewfinder for a mega massive lens, I think using these wide angle lens adapters is a really good and cheap alternative. I think you can probably get these online for $20. I find them locally for less than $10. The only challenge here is I have to design a new mount and a new mask for each one, right? Because they're yeah. all different sizes. Mm -hmm. And think There's of a... all of those um, uh, wide angle adapters that were sold in kits to, yeah. um, you know, to people who bought their DSLRs with, you know, the bag and four cards and, you know, and that crappy wide angle uh, adapter. So, yeah. uh, so they're, I... they're out there. I have had um, somewhere I lost it in my shop, one of those Rico viewfinders. And I mean, they're relatively distortion free, but they're really, really tiny. Good job, like good luck trying to use one with glasses. And like, I don't wear glasses and it's really stinky, but I would I would take a little bit of distortion off of one of those like camcorder lenses any day over, you know, having to look through something really tiny. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, some of these the distortion is not that bad especially the ones that are, are really large um the smaller it is i find the distortion to be more noticeable so if you're looking for one just pick one that's designed for a 49 millimeter lens or, or even larger i think some I'm of them, for 72. <laughs> yeah some of them <laughs> on eBay, and uh, i think amazon even have some of these adapters for less than 20 dollars that are really huge i, I kind of want to buy one just to see what it looks like but because I can access some of these locally, I, I just been searching and treasure hunting, right? Trying to find ones that look approximately right for the job. I went down the path of those wide angle adapters for your your phone, you know, the ones that'll clip on and, you know, oh, do not do that. Don't make that error. Um, go somewhere else, find, <laughs> um, you know, guess it's better than going down that path. So it's just too too small, Graham. Like not it, enough it's light. It's too, it's too small. It's it's too wide. Um, it's like looking through one of those uh, keyhole um, things. Um, it, the idea of masking that off would give you just microns of of view space. Uh, yeah, that would. Yeah, hey, not a so good not a good way. Maybe now would be a good time uh, if you have some uh, pictures, like panoramic pictures that you've taken with any of these cameras to take a look at some. Uh, let's see here. So Freeman, let's see some of these panoramic photos. All right, sounds good. So I have here some of the first test shots uh, I've taken, mostly just to try to understand if there's any light leaks, as well as to see how well the, you know, the homemade uh, mask for the viewfinder look compared which, to the actual Which camera thing. is so this? I, I just went on a quick walk downtown in Calgary yeah, which camera this is, is this shot that you're... With um... The, um, I call it the Fox Pan. Yeah, so this is the Fox Pan. So this is the 47 millimeter super uh, angle on, on the first camera I made. Okay, so this is the Nikon so FE body. Downtown Calgary, there's a bunch of um, large, very tall statues, and I just 
That's right. Yeah. And uh, it looks pretty good <laughs> when you crop it. I don't have the best scanner set up for um, doing kind of panoramic shots. Normally for regular frames, I do have a cool scan from Nikon, but um, I can't really stitch that very easily. So for this, I'm using an old Canon uh, scanner as a flat bed, uh, flatbed. I think it's the 8800F. And um, the resolution's okay, but I, I do find that it's hard for me to get the film uh, perfectly flat. So I think it's probably not the best representation of the maximum resolution you can achieve with these panoramic cameras, which is something I'm curious about, right? Because you're using a um, large format lens, but I think composition wise is very pleasing. You can easily crop it to get a um, three to one ratio, which I think is very uh, cinematic. And also it's just something you don't see all the time, except for those people that have uh, X pen. Oh, I love this one. This is where a problem with these conversions actually can be noted. And it comes down to how small the body is. Yeah, I find that, you know, with the FE, because the body is so compact, when you do decide to mount a lens, a large format lens, especially, or the press lens, you have to build in a permanent amount of shift to the lens, usually shifting the lens up by um, like two or three millimeters. And what that hap what that does is that you're basically, you're, you're shifting your lens. So everything, all the pictures you take, everything is shifted up. Slightly. And I think that's great if you are taking a lot of nature um, landscapes, right? Because now your horizon in your photo is brought down, um, just like what you see in this case. Um, but it does take some getting used to, or you can adjust your frame lines to, to try to match the amount of shift, right? Otherwise, um, you know, if you do anything close up and your camera is tilted slightly, you're going to get huge amount of distortion. Um, which, you know, can be cool as well. I, I think I'm just not very used to shooting with panorama cameras. So I find the distortion to be surprising sometimes. And um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You just have to play with it as you um, learn how to use this camera. I do really like, you know, it, it, it feels, it feels different when you take it. I think the extra field of view really um, just sucks you into the frame a little bit more. It feels like you're more immersed, which I really enjoy. I, I can see why people would pay thousands of dollars <laughs> to own an x or the uh, Fuji equivalent. I was just saying, if you can hear me, that uh, I really enjoy the, the panoramic view, but the extra peripherals, it kind of sucks you into the frame a little bit more. It, I mean, being so wide, it's also quite immersive. So it's been a lot of fun shooting with this camera. Um, it's got its idiosyncrasies, if you will. Uh, you definitely need to build a habit of, you know, double stroking and then cocking the shutter, making sure you do that um, as a habit also prevents double exposures, which I'm sure can be fun. But, uh, you know, when you're capturing something that you really want, you want to protect it. So what I like to do is every every uh, after every shot, I would double stroke just to make sure that that frame is advanced and there's no chance of double exposures. I got an exactly um, the same habit. I think if I the get band. the uh, nympho bodies, yeah, I think once you make that mistake a few times, you go like, oh well, I got to really build that habit. And sometimes I probably double stroke it more, <laughs> like four times because I've forgotten um, and that's okay. And I think a big part of building these cameras is really to think about where that shutter button is located when you know it's not in use, how easy or how likely it is to get bumped. For example, like the Mamiya Press 50 millimeter, uh, if you mount it the way it's intended, the shutter button is basically on the bottom, right? And I find that um, that same habit of double stroking and cocking the shutter would be detrimental because you would accidentally hit the shutter all the time. So for the press lenses, I find that I would double stroke it, but then I would only 
cock the shutter before each shot. So it's a little bit different of a habit. For the uh, 47 millimeter, the shutter lever is very small. So for the most part, once I cock it, it's perfectly fine. I can put it in a camera bag and not have to worry about anything. I wanted to ask a little bit about that, um, the uh, adjustment that you made, um, uh, essentially raising the lens. Um, was there, what was, I, I didn't quite, um, or shifting the lens, I guess is, is what it is, um, or yeah, whatever. Um, uh, but I, I didn't get why you did that. Um, you said, uh, uh, can you go over that Too again? big to fit. Yeah, for sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah. As Ethan put it, the lens is, is quite a lot larger, if you can see here, okay. than the body itself. So if you mount it, um, I guess, um, in line with the actual film plane, which is down here, your body is going to sit a lot higher, right? So to okay. make it a little bit more easy to handle as well as kind of look better i essentially shifted the lens up so the body sits a little lower which means that of the image circle that the lens is able to produce your your frame lines or, or your your frame is actually a little bit higher on that image circle which is actually quite desirable right like, like i mentioned before for if you're taking a lot of landscapes because because you don't want to keep tilting the camera up to get the same field of view um, because you're going to get more distortion potentially. Whereas if you have the permanent shift built in, your horizon is always a little bit lower so you can take more okay. with less distortion. So it, it is gotcha. a, um, it is a minor modification that to be honest, at the beginning, I didn't really think too much about it. I just went, okay, this is a huge lens. I'm going to mount it to make it work. As long as the coverage is there, it's fine. And I would adjust the frame line or the, the frame line mask to compensate, right? So if you look at this particular example, it, it might not be that noticeable, but the frame line mask is essentially shifted up on oh, yeah. the viewfinder as well to compensate. And I find that to be okay. Um, you definitely have probably a harder time shooting this very close up, right? Because it's already very large and now you have shift built in. So it will be, a little bit harder to, to frame uh, if you're shooting close up. But if you're using this, like most people, you're trying to get as much in as possible. You're shooting, you know, distant objects, landscapes. I think this will work just fine. So do when you, you first describe any it. Dis oh, do you see any distortion in the horizon? Um, any arcing or anything on the, um, on the horizon line? When no, you, you're talking about the viewfinder or the... No, the no, on the actual... On the film, yeah. No, no, I'm really surprised. I mean, probably because we're using large lenses that have huge image circles and we're using only the center portions, especially when we talk about the height of the frames. I find the distortion to be very hard to notice, especially on the press lenses. Uh, I took a picture of a brick wall, which I think is on my Instagram, and I couldn't really even tell that there's distortion. It looks pretty much right on. And of course, cool. if you tilt the lens, you might have more distortion, which is why I put a little, you know, bubble level in more for style points than anything else. Cause I, I like hand holding and just shooting, um, kind of, you know, handheld from the hip, if you will, but having that bubble level just makes it look like, oh, this is an actual serious tool. You know, you want to mount this somewhere. You want to adjust it for, for fine tuning, but, uh, yeah. So that when you originally it described it, I was uh, under the impression that you were getting like vignetting from the lower part of the lens, you know, coming through the body or the base plate, but it was actually just a matter of making it sit flat on a table type of uh, compactness that you made the shift. Yeah, it's a little bit of that. As you can see on this, I'm um, showing the bottom of the press pan conversion. It's really big already. So with the grip, it's already elevating the body. So it's not really the big problem. The big problem is that you wanna mount the lens cone to the front plate of the camera. 
And if you have it mounted where the actual film gate is, then you're going to have a huge part that's not really supported on the bottom of the lens cone, right? You would have to somehow design a way to, to support it better by either bolting it to the bottom plate or, or something else. So I mostly did that to, to ensure that the, um, I guess the strength of the lens cone is, is, is good and it's passing as much of the load directly into the front plate as possible. Now this, this camera, you know, the lens is probably heavier than the camera itself. So most of the time you're gonna be holding it by the lens um, or by the grip. So it may, maybe it's not a big deal, but uh, it's basically one of those like, you know, uh, detours I went down and said, okay, it works. So I'm gonna keep using it that way. If someone tells me they want it perfectly aligned, sure, I can design it. But right now it seems to be working great. Why, why mess with it, right? So Freeman, what's next for at Watch Me Make? What, what are uh, some of the things that you're interested in building uh, in the coming months of quarantine? That's a good question, Ethan. I think the next project is really trying to figure out if I can mass produce. And when I say mass produce, I mean like five, um, some of the cameras I've been working on. Uh, I think there's enough interest, especially based on, you know, seeing how many people are using uh, 3D printed Goodman cameras, such as just a zone, uh, as well as cameras from Camadactyl and um, I think Panamicron. Mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, this camera is, is functionally excellent and it's not extremely expensive. So I want to build maybe half a dozen of these press pen lenses, uh, sorry, camera bodies, uh, so that the user can just pick up their own lens and attach to it. It also makes it a little easier to ship because I'm shipping out of Canada. Um, I think I mentioned already that uh, I recently purchased a bunch of NIMSLO bodies. So I think that would be a new challenge and probably produce some pretty nice looking, you know, single stroke panoramic camera. So that would be the next project for me. Ooh, All right. Uh, so if, if anybody's out there and uh, wants to get a hold of you, uh, do they just get a hold of you through your Instagram, which is uh, watch me make on Instagram. And we also have a link in the show notes. Um, uh, but how would people get a hold of you for that? Yeah, in terms of getting uh, a camera built, like kind of a commission type where, you know, you want some flexibility in terms of lens choices, the best way to reach me is to uh, instant message me on Instagram. Um, I do also have a website. It's uh, Trastic.com. So that's uh, T-R-A-S-T-I-C.com. It's kind of just a random name I picked and uh, I wanted it to, you know, be whatever I needed it to be. So I use that and you can reach me directly on the website. There is a contact form uh, as well as you can get way more information on the technical side of, of the build, a uh, little bit of cost, a little bit of lens choices. I'm trying to add to that website so that I don't get the same question over and over again when people contact me about these cameras. All right. Um, so you're, uh, um, it, so you're, you'll talk to them about whatever, uh, are, are the options. If you, I just went to Trastic, uh, dot com first, I didn't know, uh, about this. Um, and you, wow. Okay. So you've got, um, some grips. So you and Ethan can fight over the grip, um, uh, market, uh, the panoramic cameras and some lens conversions, um, so, oh, I see there, oh, these are all contact me. Oh, and, and some more info stuff. So, uh, yeah. Uh, cool. Yeah, the website, uh, the website is very bare bones, Graham. It's not, uh, I haven't put a lot of time into it. I was originally trying to see how well or how easy it is to set up like an e-commerce website, but, uh, it's a little beyond 
what I'm used to. So I basically use it as a kind of a general information page. Okay. And uh, both those links will be in the show notes for anybody um, who wants to get a hold of Freeman. So, um, so uh, um, we're, we're looking at that. What's um, uh, I'm going to steal one of Ethan's um, uh, questions that he always asks. And that is, what's in your dream journal what would you like to share what are the what's the you know the moonshot camera what what you know if you had unlimited resources or if you had reasonable uh time to do something what what's what's that dream Freeman clearly already has unreasonable amount of time yeah. <laughs> <laughs> built how many of these things in five months yeah uh yeah, probably build at least one a month, which is actually not that quick because I, I think I can crank these out pretty fast now with all the files and then the processes ironed out. Um, but in terms of like the perfect camera or the perfect camera accessory, I really think that eventually there's going to be an, a market and maybe even a need for a uh, ultra thin digital sensor that you can use for, for film cameras. And um, I think that would be the ultimate project in terms of trying to design something that will allow you to use, you know, your M3 as a digital camera or your F3 or whatever you want, right? And I think the technology is definitely gonna get there one day, it's just, by the time that happens, is it going to be so specialized that a hobbyist is going to, you know, have a real hard time accessing those parts and components and the, the programming and algorithms required to get there? I've seen folks modify, you know, the Sony APS-C cameras to, to act as a film back, right? And that's really exciting to me. Uh, I just think that to, to to get the full feeling, you need to have that full frame sensor. And I think there's someone that has worked on it, but I haven't seen anything that's, you know, that looks like a purchased product, right? It's still very much, you know, wires, everything, duct tape and electrical tape. But I think that's something that we've been talking about on the podcast for years now, certainly. Um, you know, I've been following, I'm back in a few actual full frame open source camera projects. And I think the technology is there, but the price is not, right? So I could buy like a Sony 24, 48 megapixel sensor and it would cost probably a little bit more than buying the A7 that it would come in. Um, and maybe, you know, I could spend a couple of years uh, if I ripped out the digit chip or, or whatever, you know, image processor that came with it you know, building it back into it. And certainly people like uh, I'm back have real, you know, kind of crazy engineering workarounds. But my feeling on it is, you know, just from a pragmatic standpoint, uh, that by the time you do that, right, like the experience of using the camera becomes nicer. I, I like using Leica's over my Sony A7. But in terms of image quality, like, the simple solution is to take my Leica lens and slap an adapter on it and then just put it on the Sony. Um, and I think, yeah, I, I think this is something that I could do for $600,000 over the course of uh, two years if I didn't do anything else. And I think there's a lot of people who could probably do it a whole lot better than me, but not much cheaper. What's, what's the early bird special price on that? Is that um, $600,000? $600, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Graham, can I put you down? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Oh. Commit right now. No, but Absolutely. I, you know, I think like ultimately what, what happens is like, you know, you, you're ultimately going to want controls for things like uh, ISO and, um, you know, I don't know if that camera would eventually use an electronic shutter or, you know, wind up using the limited range of mechanical shutters that, then trigger the uh, image capture process. Um, but like all, all of the, uh, the controls, like white balance, right? Um, all of that like are built into a digital camera and like, don't get me started on Sony's terrible uh, menu systems. Uh, I still love their cameras and like, 
by the time I figure out how to get a analog camera experience out of a Sony, like Sony's going to fix their menus one of these days. They're going to get to like the A25R7 million. <laughs> but, um, you know, like I have no problem with their sensors. I have no problem with the amount of lenses you can stick on them. I just like, I wish it was a little bit more like a Fuji in terms of, you know, the way you interacted with it. Um, and yeah, I don't want to poo poo the idea. It's one that I've had a million times and would love to see and would buy one from you if you can get it under $300,000. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I, I, I see from a practical standpoint, like the issue is that mirrorless cameras have just done most of that or you could you could uh, work a swap right um what is uh, three hundred thousand in butter grips uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thirty thousand, fifteen thousand butter grips <laughs> um yeah 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 it's definitely not a realistic uh, you know dream project but i just feel like the technology is definitely getting there, but the market, the demand is not there. So the cost to do something like that is going to be astronomical. But um, it's nice to dream, right? <laughs> so maybe it. what the next step would be after that is you would have the two sensor panoramic version. <laughs> so you would stick to your butt two sensors next to each other and you'd have a stitching program. You could probably tilt them a certain way. Yeah, never mind. You know, I think like a lot of people um, like to complain about the on back because it uses a small sensor and it reads from, you know, a, a screen that it's projecting on. Um, and a lot of people are just like, you know, why, why? right like uh th this image quality is terrible and i think it's it has nothing to do with the cleverness of the guys behind on back i think it has everything to do with the sensors that they're able to purchase uh, at a reasonable price and yeah. you know i don't i don't know that cell phone camera sensors or raspberry pi sensors are going to get big enough that we're ever going to see uh full frame sensors that you can buy in like you know, development boards or just the chip at a reasonable price. Um, I kind of see sensors getting smaller again as like computational photography gets better, uh, particularly with a lot of new Apple technology. But uh, man, the day that Raspberry Pi releases a full frame or medium format sensor is, you know, the, the day a lot of uh, camera enthusiasts and electronic engineers and I personally lose about a year of my life into the hole. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, when the I'm back came out, I was really skeptical about it, mostly because, you know, for a lot of us, the tactile feeling of the camera is really important to so the weight and balance and how to, you know, hold to the face. And when I looked at the design of the I'm back, you're using, you know, a mirror box, right, to, to take a photo of the actual um, ground glass, if you will, on the film plane. And that means you have this huge thing that's coming out the back of your camera. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't understand, you know, for someone that has to really press, you know, my face into a camera to be able to see everything. How am I going to be able to do that? Now I have this extra contraption in front of it. So that was Waste always level finder. That, <laughs> that that is actually a good idea. I mean, putting it on an F3 would be um, would make a lot of sense. Yeah, and I, you know, I think like if they can sell enough to hang in there until there's at least you know APS-C size sensors that they can buy, you know, uh, cheaply and reasonably, like, I mean, it it is clearly not hard for them to delete all of the mechanical components and just put the yeah. sensor in the right place. Um, it's it's clear to me that you know those guys are very very clever. I love what they're doing. I just wish they could get a Sony sensor for less money than, you know, a Sony camera. Yeah, for sure. I guess you got to really do a big Kickstarter. <laughs> yeah, that's, that'd be my Kickstarter scam. <laughs> the thing you would never build that makes a million dollars. Meanwhile, I'm trying to sell things for $3,000 over here <laughs> and deliver them. <laughs> um, Hey, hey, Graham, 
Um, yeah. You've got some large uh, focusing screens around these days. Yeah, you you want to you want to show us what you've been working on? Yeah. So uh, this is the Esquilax, um, and um, uh, I, and I have to um, give Chad uh, Chad Green a shout out for um, for suggesting the naming. I did a poll on um instagram about what i should name this camera and he's the one who came up with esquilax and an esquilax by the way is a horse with the head of a rabbit and the body of a rabbit so um but it's so if horse. it's got the head of a rabbit and a body of a rabbit what part is a horse it's the horse it is a horse it just has the head of a rabbit and the body of a rabbit so uh so, but, it's a but, simpsons um thing i think chief wiggum um was the one who uh who came up with that um or at least introduced it so this is and i'm and, and i don't even really have uh enough space on this um so i'm showing this on the on the video version i am uh i'm showing this camera um it is a four by ten sized uh large format i do not have a film holder with me i did some developing of the first four shots, and I um, <clears throat> and I discovered that um, uh, it, it might have it might have had a light generating device inside. There were so many light leaks, um, but I've now um, uh, taped them off, and I'm going to do uh, probably tomorrow. I'm going to probably do some uh, some test shots. Um, there, uh, there. If, if you follow me on Instagram, you probably saw a different bellows, which was some really nice material. Um, this is the second bellows I built for this because I got the geometry on this side wrong. Um, I didn't get the the angle, um, and the, the, and this is the side view. Um, but it um, uh, it is. You know, it's a four by ten camera. It is made out of wood. <laughs> now look at my cuts. Um, it, and for those of you who are on um, uh, listening to this on audio, they are the worst wood cuts um, ever. Um, so the only thing that's three D printed is the front panel, um, and um, it has a um, a Fujinon two ten. W, which is the, um, it, which is an, uh, an eight by 10 lens because it's a four by 10 camera. And it, um, and I, and I'm not sure that the, that this actually fully covers eight by 10. I think it might, might vignette in the corners. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and open this up and then open up the, um, be, uh, open up the aperture because I'm going to show you guys from the back. Uh, essentially, it's got a couple of components, and I need to raise it in my lens. Okay, so this is the body. Um, the body has a uh, an isolated, stabilized, non-moving part that's attached to the tripod, and in the front, it has a uh, a, a sliding piece of you know a piece of wood that has the front standard on it. And that will slide in and out. And for infinity focus, it is essentially all the way back. It is as far back as it will go. Um, this I made actually to be able to extend out to 43 centimeters. Um, and because I don't know whether, you know, whether I can come across a lens like that or not. Ooh, let me. Um, so uh, the, this bellows will not extend out that, that, that far. This bellows will extend out about 350 uh, millimeters or 35 centimeters. Um, so, um, it, so it has that. This is not the focusing mechanism. This is um, like the front of any view camera. Um, this is you get it to a, the right point. And I think we could call it the coarse focusing mechanism. Coarse focusing mechanism would, would, is perfectly good. Here, let me do this. Oh, let me do it this way. Um, and so essentially what's going on is you get it to a certain point, and I have a pin that keeps 
the the front standard from moving back and forth. So like for this lens, I have the infinity focus here. And then on the back of the camera, I have uh, the back standard um, essentially moves back and forth with a dial. So if you, uh, I'm gonna turn it from the side and you'll see that I'm actually moving this back. Now, this is a very, this is like, um, this is a three eighths um, threaded rod. So it's a three eighths, 16 threads per inch. So it is a very fine thread, finer than you would normally find on a focusing mechanism um, in the back. Graham's but, about to have the world's strongest wrists. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, so um, it, what, the, what this does is it allows you to really easily find that point of focus because you're going, you know, it's a very nice, slow uh, focusing um, system. And by the way, my ground glass, which is plexi um, holder is pretty, uh, oh, I'm getting a lot of reflections in what yeah. I did was yeah okay so um here let me turn that computer that screen off and um i'm going to show it focusing and i'm going to turn the light off here and i'm going to turn another light off here okay so um you can see that i am focusing through uh on that on the object uh, that's on my back wall, which is a poster, and you can, and uh, you you can get pretty good tight, uh, good focus. My camera that I'm uh, taking the the uh, the video with is frozen. Okay, the the camera that I'm taking the video with is um, uh, is not focused properly, but that's the idea. Um, I have a mark here um, for infinity focus. So I can leave it here on infinity focus. I can leave the back on infinity focus. And then I put the front on infinity focus marks. And then that I have a really good starting point. Um, it has these, these wood pieces that are, you know, essentially a graph lock. Um, this holder um, was the end of the day. Uh, my workshop, I, I, I want to remind you, uh, my workshop is a um, is my backyard. I live in Florida, 95 degrees of heat and 95% humidity will give you um, uh, a certain problem, and that is called bad, bad judgment um, and no brain power um, at, when you you know when you've been out there for four hours. Um, and so, uh, it's a problem so throughout the state re rebuilt. <laughs> well, there, yeah, it is the bad judgment state. I, I'm, there's no question about that. So, uh, so basically, um, I've taken a couple of photos and, um, um, they are, uh, I took some, some photos for, um, for the purpose of just, um, uh, here, I'm going to just bring them up. Um, uh, for the purpose of, I think I'm going to bring them up. There we go. Um, just testing, testing focus. I wanted to make sure that the, um, the distance of the film and the distance of the ground glass were the same. And, um, I found that that is indeed the case. Um, the only problem is that, and I'm bringing them up slowly here. Let me uh, let me get to it. JPEG view, and why are these things not showing? Hey, while while you're doing that, Freeman, have you ever built or worked with a large format camera? No, I have not. Um, the largest I've worked on is the six by nine medium format. Mm -hmm. It seems but really definitely... crazy to me that that you would start with something other than four by five or eight by ten. It's so much harder to build smaller cameras, but um, I guess if you're building oil and gas equipment, uh, it's no problem. Watch I think for me, it's just tools available, right? Like I don't have a table saw, I don't have a router. I have a 
lathe and a mill. So I see a few printers uh, behind you, Freeman. <laughs> yes, the printers came after. Um, I've always had the the metal working tools a lot earlier, and then you know, with 3D printers, I started with 3D printing when I was in university on those open source uh, Mandel printers, mm -hmm. but they never worked as well as I mean, as well as I could make them anyways. And uh, I did back a Kickstarter that gave me another printer that also did not work. <laughs> so I had some bad luck with 3D printing at the beginning until um, more recently I got the Anticubic, which I think was around this time last year. So it's really changed my perspective about what's possible, right? It's such an inexpensive printer. And um, from that point on, I think I've really stepped up, you know, modeling and 3D printing and learning how to deal with different types of materials. And uh, finally, I'm able to buy another 3D printer just to, you know, start playing with direct extrusion and uh, try out some other things like automatic bed leveling, et cetera, which I'm sure you guys have all already dealt with. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm still relatively new, but I found that once you dial things in and don't touch it and don't break it, it seems to basically repeat itself pretty well. Um, for a while. For a while. Yeah, for a while. <laughs> and then you'll do something like um, I got some, uh, I ordered some PLA and the box said PLA on it and it had ABS in it. And I, oh. I hadn't printed ABS for a year. And it stank, and I couldn't figure out why it was stinking, and it w wasn't shiny. It was matte, and and yeah, that set me two weeks behind on printing three cameras. Uh, which, yeah. So, um, hey, I've got a. Uh, where's my present now? Okay, I've got a couple of images. I'm gonna go with a window. I'm going to go with this one. Um, okay, so this is um, one of the things that you're going to see on this is that it is um, horribly, uh, first of all, it's on X-ray film. That's the reason why there are scratches everywhere. But this is entirely about what is right here. This is my infinity focus check. And there is a camera, or excuse me, there is a, a car body. Um, that is sitting in the yard across from my street. Yes, I live in Florida. Just a car body sitting right there, and it is in perfect perfect focus. And let me see if I'll take your me. word for it. Yeah, um, I, I've I've hit the zoom on this. By the way, um, these scans are stupidly done at three thousand. Um, dots per inch, pixels per inch. And so that means that this is a 30,000 pixel image. Um, and uh, and I zoomed in to 25%. So do you see the car now? Nope. What do you see? <laughs> Light leaks. Light leaks, yeah. Has the, uh, has the image zoomed in at all? No. Okay. So that's the problem. It's just it's just giving me the uh, here. Let's switch. Let's switch out. Uh, I'm going to stop presenting. I'm going to present, and I'm going to go with my entire screen and share. And then now, can you see me? Now I can, can see you, you. See. not your. Uh, you don't see you. that. Uh, a bit of a lag. Oh, yeah. I think still. I didn't hit share, but. Okay, now it says I'm presenting. Okay. I'm, yeah. Do you see, okay, a, we car? see a car? Yeah. It's like a station wagon? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a, it's an old Ford Explorer. Um but this is um that's uh, what I was checking and that's in what I'd consider perfect focus when you consider uh, Okay, let's do this. Yeah, it doesn't look like focus is your issue here. <laughs> yep. No, focus is not the issue. So that's the entire image. And I was just checking that. Um, so no, light leaks are the problem. Um, 
So uh, what I did, and I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing because that image is embarrassing. Um, so what I did was um, I uh, put tape around it. And there are a couple of things that I wanted to I wanted to show you guys before we finish talking about it. I started off making bellows. I made three different bellows uh, just as tests, just to see if I could do it. And what I, I made a sandwich. Um, so I'm using cardstock, and the cardstock I used was Bristol board, uh, big pads of Bristol board. Um, I made the shapes. Um, and if you go to my feed, um, Graham Homemade Camera on Instagram, um, and it's all one word, Graham Homemade Camera, um, you'll see the, sh the shapes that I cut out. Um, and then I glued it to this material. And this material you can see is shiny on one side and matte on the other, well, or matte-ish on the other, which is perfect because this is was facing to the middle. That was facing to the inside. Nothing's going to really reflect off that, which is good. Um, so uh, the problem is it's too thick. It really is too thick, and it made a bellows that would not compress. So uh, I did a couple of things. I ordered um, a, uh, you know, like a picnic tablecloth that was white, or not white, excuse me, that was black, um, and it wasn't thick enough. It didn't block out the light. So what I ended up with is this material, and I ordered it from eBay, and um, uh, it's blackout cloth material. And this is like the material that you would, you know, put a sunshade in your in the window of your car. Um, but it's very thin, and it's also the kind of material that they make um, – uh, changing bags out of. Um, it is a little bit thinner than you want it. And I'm going to see if we'll be able to see. Um, so this is my, my um, cam or my phone flashlight. And I don't, yeah. Oh, because I turned the light, I turned the flashlight off somehow. There we go. And you can see through that, right? Mm -hmm. But you can't see through two layers. So um, it is light tight at two layers. And so what I did was I made a sandwich out of, you know, I had the shiny side in, put the cardboard, which is the structure then essentially just fold it over this material and that's what i have for my bellows so i am disappointed graham that you did not make the outside the shiny silver yeah, space could, band camera and I maybe a good reflector in a photo shoot um well okay so the camera this color scheme is yellow and gray right with a little bit of wood color on it uh -huh. But yellow and gray. So I've got a couple of grays. Um, so the question was, do I go the silver or do I go black? And I went with black on that. I could have I mean black is cleaner, but silver is more bling. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um next time uh I'll bling it up. I do have more material. What's nice about this is this was two yards for ten dollars. Uh I used about a yard and a quarter. So, um, you know, I have enough for a four by five or some other sized camera. I had some of the, uh, this, okay. So the first bellows, this was the outside material. And let me show you this again here. Look That's at perfect. that. Oh, That's really that good. Match? Oh, that is beautiful. That is beautiful. But unfortunately that would not give me a light light tight one and then i also had this as alternative i was gonna have wood bellows <laughs> is that not is that not bad um so so anyway so this is this is my foray i think i have a working camera i just have to track down all the light leaks i believe i have the light leaks tracked down 
I am not 100% positive, but I'm going to shoot some tomorrow. And, um, and then I'll be, um, uh, and I'll develop it and I'll, and I'll figure it out. Um, here is something that, uh, so I bought this to shoot x-ray film and paper. in. However, um, and many of you have probably seen this on eBay. There's a guy out of Russia, Ukraine, somewhere in the former Soviet Union, who is selling... I think you mean the future Soviet Union. The future Soviet Union. No, I think that that's where we live. Isn't that? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Freeman, you live in Kanakistan. Um, <laughs> that's... <laughs> um, so um, the... Uh, what it is is it's aerial um, film that I think is the nine inch wide film that he's cutting down into four by five sheets and it's it is thin thin thin. There's no reason why I can't butt two of those up next to each other and shoot onto uh, onto that film. So I bet if he's is, cutting it down and you send him a message, uh, he'd just or, cut you four by tens. Right, four by ten. That's that's really what I need to do. Um, but I have, I have a hundred sheets of this stuff. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to try it out. Um, I'm having a lot of fun with this and, uh, um, I'm, you know, I know, uh, 50 things that I would do differently. Um, but, and, and I'm already kind of planning out a four by five that I'm going to do using the same scheme. Um, but, uh, or, um, oh, I can't tell you, uh, we've got a, a future guest who's doing eight by eight and that's all I'm going to say. Do He's we? making his own film holders that are eight by eight. And, uh, he said when he's done with the project, he'll come on the show. Um, so I'm calling you out, um, to come on the show. So that's, that's essentially, that's my, um. That's my that's my COVID camera, um, uh, and I'm really excited about uh, about that. Hey, Ethan, is this coming out in August? Um, out in August late or August or early September. Well, the question is, I was going to make the mention of the uh, zine that we are doing, and yeah, make it if it comes out afterwards. Well, but. But Just if I make mention of the deadline being the end of August. Oh, yeah. Then probably not the place to do it. Not the place to do it. But um, I know me. If this comes out on August 7th, and this is the first I mean, it's August 9th right now. It's August Most likely, 9th. yeah, this we, is coming. We release on the 7th. What is your problem? I released on the 7th. I just haven't uploaded the audio yet. Oh, okay. That was that was the uh, Sam Traxel episode. Oh, this okay. Either the twenty first or the seventh, depending upon the queue. Did you okay. take a time note for this? I am cutting this conversation no, out for sure. No, we're leaving this in. I'm not taking a time note. The time note is your own. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm I want blame to be known where it should be. So, I, so anyway. <laughs> So anyway, we have uh, the Homemade Camera Podcast 2020 COVID uh, edition um, zine coming out. So here's what we want, um, and this is what you should expect. Pictures of the camera, pictures from the camera, and um, a little write-up of, you know, uh, about, uh, about it. You tell us um, about it. Uh, we need to know who you are, so and give us your uh, Instagram or, or Flickr handle and all that type of stuff. And then build pictures. I took a ton of build pictures on this. Right, and also um, build drawings are great or photos of yeah. those drawings we'd like to see. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, um, yeah, uh, this is um, uh, this is what we want. And uh, I just heard Graham from the Sunny 16 talking about He's he took a um, Yashica four x four TLR and took the front off it and put it put a six by six back on it because there was some problem with it. So uh, he's he's yeah <laughs> Ethan's going. Why would he do that? Because he's Graham Jago. That's the reason why he would do that. 
he's the best. <laughs> but um, but no, I'm excited to see that. He's uh he's posted some stuff in his Instagram, which of course is myopic me. Myopic underscore me. Uh myopic me, I think. So anyway, um so uh Freeman, we're gonna see your cameras or camera or several different options in that, yeah? Definitely, yes. Okay. Way cool. to put him on the spot, Graham. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, we could always take a time note and edit it out, which nope. <laughs> leave no. it in. <laughs> so so yeah. So anyway, that's that's what I've got to show. Ethan, do you have anything to show or tell or anything? Uh, no, I think we you know, we're probably approaching a three hour episode now and we'll I'll throw right. one about the scanner next week. Um, right. Um uh, let's see. Uh, Nick had to leave, head off to, uh, to do a work, do a work. Um, uh, hit Nick up on Instagram. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to kind of, uh, take a little sidestep. Uh, his wife, Jean, um, has a show that is up that is incredible. She does metal work. Most of these are flowers that are metalwork I have, um, uh, I bought for, um, for my wife's birthday last year, a leaf that Jean does, um, that's metal. It's about that big. Um, her work is incredible. So hit Nick up. He is Avi Nick, A-V-Y N-I-C-K on Instagram. Uh, maybe he's not, maybe he's just Nick Lyle on Instagram and, but Seriously, take a look at her work. It is phenomenal. It is really phenomenal. I, I I tried to share. I tried to trade some old broken camera parts and uh, for for one of the pieces, and she'd have nothing to do with it. So, so anyway. Um, so yeah, do we uh, do we have anything else that you guys want to? Um, Freeman, is there anything that we did not ask you that you would like to talk about? Oh, wow. I think the only thing that I would like to know more about is behind the scenes. I feel like there's a lot of tools and and workflows that we often don't want to share because it's not very interesting or um, it, it doesn't have, you know, the same, like people don't really know what we're talking about half the time, right? For example, like ah. um, to focus, I built one of these ground glass with an eye loop contraptions to allow me to basically press this against the film plane and, and check focus. I think there's a lot of interesting nice. little tools that uh, it would be nice to, to have more focus on that. And I, I'm sure you guys being, you know, building lots of cameras, there's a lot of ways to optimize. I'd love to learn more about. Yeah. Um, like for instance, I built a, uh, uh, because I'm building the Krakens and every um, Kraken, you know, I mean, it, it can take probably about 150 different lenses. Uh, I have more than 100 lenses in the database for the Kraken, including some you can't use. But um, the uh, I built a an optical te test bench to test flange focal distance. I'm going to show that in the next show. So. Um, those of you on um, YouTube watching this, that'll be something that'll come up. So good, good, good talk. On, I mean, good idea on that. We we should maybe just do a tools tool segment, tools uh, and jigs. Tools, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Good thinking. So I, I have um, exactly that same thing you built. Mine is built out of um, an old broken uh, RB67 back with yeah. a homemade piece of ground glass and a taped on, uh, you know, loop. And I use it to calibrate every homunculus that goes out the door. I like to say that every uh, homunculus is calibrated to Sandia Peak at uh, <laughs> a thousand feet um, right outside of Albuquerque. I can see it. Um, I'm trying to think of like other tools that I have. Um, for a lot of laser cut things, I will build a jig had some alignment issues on some of the last Polaroid scan trays um, because I had been hand aligning them. And I said, you know, just swap out anything that has a, you know, uh, issue with it to the retailer and I'll just add that menu to the next order. And then I'll just, I'll 
build a box out of a material that does not um, stick to the acrylic solvent. And so everything will be, you know, it's like not a complicated thing, but um, assembly jigs are really important. Um, I'm working on a scanner right now, um, which mostly is not glued, but there's a couple of laminated pieces. Uh, acrylic solvent is more of a weld than a glue right? because it actually melts the acrylic until it's one piece. And so it's very much so you don't have a second chance at anything. So you just got to cut extras and plan on throwing 10% out, you know, after QC. But um, all of that stuff, you know, like a wooden or wax paper lined wooden jig uh, that, you know, won't glue and holds everything in place, I think is kind of, <clears throat> I, I try not to collect a million jigs, but I, I have a, anything that needs gluing gets a jig usually. Um, trying to think what else do I have that are like camera making specific tools. Um, I built a shutter tester a while ago, which is useful. That's like an open source GitHub project. Um, I have a much more complicated shutter tester that's built into a different product. So that will not be open source per se, but um, yeah, I, I've tried really hard. Um, so like I build very specialized machinery for like industrial processes as you do, right? And it's all very big and it probably does one thing really well at uh, high throughput. Um, but I've, you know, what's really nice to me about 3D printers is it's like, oh, it's the computer of tools, right? It's it's a tool that could be anything, not anything within limits, but it, it could be a lot of things without, you know, setting up, um, you know, injection molding tooling or uh, milling tooling or routing tooling. Um, you know, I have a limited amount of space, looks like you do too. And so like, um, you know, if it's if it's not like a special sanding drill bit that I have built uh, out of a, a pencil or a screwdriver and some sandpaper, um, if it's going to be big, I, I try and figure out a way not to collect, you know, uh, like build specific tooling that you know is just for one of seventy products that I offer. Um, but you know, a lot of things are inevitable. Yeah, I, I really like the website that, um, you know, Homemade Cameras website has some tips and some materials outlined. I think that is immensely helpful. I think there's a lot of things that I'm using now that I never thought about. Um, for example, you know, to make sure multiple pieces mesh together and seal tight, I've used, you know, black uh, wool to, to, to line it, similar to some old, you know, scene cameras. And then eventually I just said, why don't I just buy a large O-ring or even just the O-ring material? And then when you design your 3D prints, just make grooves in it and then put that O-ring material in, right? Oh, yeah. And then alternatively, I've used a lot of liquid electrical tape, which also has that same function, but an O-ring would be way less mess. And once you design the groove, it's going to be the perfect thing every time. Freeman, I don't know so. if you've gotten into printing TPU yet, but I've um, less for cameras than other projects that I've done. I've printed quite a few uh, TPU O rings for pen seals, and uh, yeah, they they're not as nice as like a cast rubber O ring or an extruded rubber O ring, but uh, they'll do the job for a, a lot of things, particularly if you can compress them. Yeah, no, to be honest, that's why I got the printer in the back there, right? I want to upgrade it with direct extrusion so I can print more flexible materials. I'm so happy right now with the Anycubic printing PET G that I'm scared to do anything with it. <laughs> so, totally. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You don't want to swap it out if it's uh, if it's doing it correctly. Now, I will say that I have an Ender 3 that has the standard uh, Bowden tube feed, and I have once printed TPU um, correctly with it, but it was just once, so I'm not going to say that you can do it. So, um, okay. but but I, I did, did uh, I was able to do that just once. So, Graham, you're a big user of the Ender printers, then? Yeah, yeah. I have I have one Ender three, that um, uh, and that's kind of one of the one of my shortcomings uh, in my builds is that I have one, 
and right now I'm building a lot of Krakens. Um, and um, so, you know, those go first, right? So I'm not doing yeah. a lot of development. Um, and uh, and I really, uh, I really wish I had room for two and I could, but I'd have to, you know, my wife would divorce me and, you know, all that would, would happen. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, yeah, I'd love to have a, have a room full of them. Uh, part of the deal is that, um, they are immensely repairable. Um, you know, I mean, it's essentially all open source. I had a, a board go bad in, uh, March. Um, and I just bought a new board, you know, and put a new board in. And actually that board was bad too. I, and I bought another one. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what I have now works perfectly. Um, so if anybody wants a couple of bad ender boards, I have them. Uh, I never did send that one back. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, it's just that one, you know, and also one other thing that, as you know, and Ethan, as you know, and if anybody is interested in getting into 3D printing, do plan on actually making adjustments and replacing parts and doing all that type of thing. They are not uh, a buy it and use it and, um, oh, I've got to change something in a year. Um, you got to be able to replace um, the throat and the uh, and the nozzles and all that type of stuff, but it's really easy. There are a hundred YouTube videos on how to do it and it's not really anything to be afraid of. Um, but, but do plan on doing that. They're, they're temperamental machines. You know, they're, I mean, we're on what gen two of these machines, maybe gen three. Um, we're not at appliance level yet on these things. Um, we're, we're at, um, the crank telephone, um, still, you know, where, um, you know, there could be a hundred things in that box that go wrong. Well, no, on a crank telephone, there are probably three things <laughs> that could go wrong, but you might have to, you know, open it up and repair, you know, and that's just be okay with that. And, and it's not hard. Um, and don't be afraid and don't think you got a bad ender because on your third print, it clogged. You didn't. Yeah, I think if you get a good print on your first couple of tries, you're you're really you're ahead the lucky of lucky ones. Yeah. <laughs> right. I spent about three weeks with my first printer way back in the day where yeah. I think I did not leave my living room and I did not shower. And I just <laughs> stared at every print until I could do it right. And eventually my girlfriend was like, yo, dude, you need to bathe and you need to like... Okay, so house. Ethan, that period of time that you're talking about is different from any other week of time. Yeah, because of uh, your... on any other week, I don't bathe, but I do other <laughs> things besides like <laughs> just stare at the extrusion. Like, and it's you know, like I, I would run a two, three hour print and I'd spend the whole time just like watching it. <laughs> you know, uh, I still watch it go. <laughs> I'm running about eight yeah. prints right now. I don't care. I'll check them for accuracy when they are done. When they're done, right. So. Yeah, I sometimes build my models with a little bit of extra so that if the first layer comes out really ugly, I can just sand it a little bit to get it to look good, right? Right. There was a lot of uh, kind of Asperger Z Bronco Pan customers who uh, got pieces and were like, I redesigned this so the tolerances are perfect. And I said, like, I'm not going to put that up because somebody's going to print that. It's the tolerances are perfect on your machine. Somebody's right. going to print that, and they're not going to get it right, and they're going to have no room to file anything. And like it, it's designed to be open for other people to make. And uh, you you just have to print a lot of particularly precise fits, oversized, if you're not controlling the production process. For sure. Yeah, that's right. I find like black felt to be excellent. You know, the adhesive back black felt. Mm -hmm. I just cut them into strips and I use that whenever there's a gap that I need to take care of. <laughs> yeah, if I get a gap, unfortunately, it's got to go in the trash. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's there's a little bit of wiggle room in the fit of anything that I send out, but no, no gaps filled with locking. <laughs> I can't do that. Well, 
it's actually designed mostly to, to have interlocking fits, but I like to have the felt just to make sure that the interlocking fits doesn't have any, you know, leaks, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It would be good to... Use... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, oh, it's fine. I was just going to say it would be good to, to capture all these important tips and tricks. Because I do have people asking for, you know, the SDL files, and I would have to go, well, if I give you this, you probably won't get it to print right just because it's all calibrated to my machine. My machine is finicky in some regards, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, it's always a risk you take. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Bronco Pan was an exercise in answering three months' worth of those questions. Yeah. Why isn't uh, this well, perfect? Why does it take me more than three minutes to assemble? One of the things that I've done uh, on the on the Kraken is, um, and I actually need to update the website uh, to do this, is say I have a lens with a 98 millimeter flange focal distance. That's what I find everywhere. You print the 96 and then you shim it up yeah. because getting it right at 98, I have about three or four. Um, when I was, when I was first building this, I did, uh, you know, I looked up what the, you know, what the, the specs were and I printed them and they came out, you know, like spot on. And I got suckered down the path that every one of them was going to be spot on. And it, that is so not the case. Right. And people's uh, lenses are different. You know, yeah, like I don't okay. have people ship me lenses for the OGs. Yeah. And like, if I can't make it perfect, I just give them a little bit of back focus because I have no idea what shutter their lens is going to be mounted in or whether it's been right. dropped in the last 70 years that it's existed or, yeah. you know. I, I like doing the print for, print for this, uh, print for room to shim because that's what Leica did, right? That's, that's what they all do. You take a Nikon F apart, there's paper shins under the lens mount. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, and uh, all those old Voigtlanders, they had all those uh, shims. So, yeah, yeah, it's um, the, yeah, the things that we learn as we go. We should have, um, we should have just uh, an episode where we talk about tools. I think that that would be good. Maybe we have a... That's a real Nick episode. Uh, yeah. <laughs> or a round table. Um, you know, maybe we do a round table, bring in a bunch of old uh, um, guests and say, okay, so what's your trip? You're going to lose your mind. It's just going to be Lucas talking about watchmakers lathes. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and that's not a problem at all because it's going to help people. Right. You know, um, I don't know what one of those lathes costs or, uh, those micro millers, um, anywhere from $500 to a hundred thousand dollars or $500. Yeah. Yeah. Although so. you guys in the U S with Sherline is quite good. Mm -hmm. Um, price point wise, you don't have to buy a European Swiss made lathe or mill. The Sherlines are, very well made. Yeah, I've done none of that. I well, hey, <laughs> before we, uh, well, you know, I'm I'm happy talking about lathes and tools forever, but maybe this would be a good time to uh, one last time ask Freeman how people can find him on the internet and roll some credits. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, you can find me typically on uh, Instagram, and uh, it's at watch me make and the whole reason for that is originally i was into watches so i thought that was a funny uh -huh. name but of course now it's just a, a, a way to display or showcase some of the things i'm making i also have a website uh, it's called uh, trastic.com and it's uh, t-r-a-s-e-i-c.com once again just a random seven letter word I could find that sounds like an actual word. And uh, I use that as a way to, you know, post information so that people can find out more about what I do as well as some of the background on the, the parts used, right? That way saves a lot of time. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to um, my first kind of client, if you will. Uh, it's uh, at, uh, let me just get this right. His name is Arturo and uh, his Instagram handle is why do you photograph 
all one word. Um, I want to give a shout out specifically because when I first started the press pen, I did not even have a press lens. So I had no idea how I was going to design everything. And he took a chance on me in the sense that he sent me the lens and everything so I can make this camera for him. So with that, I was able to design all the files and make the, the latest versions, right? So I uh, really appreciate that. And I think as a maker, uh, having a patron or someone that's interested in, in you know, progressing their work is uh, a real blessing. So thanks. Okay. And um, Ethan, how can people get a hold of you? People can find me at, at Camerdactyl on Instagram or Camerdactyl.com. You, we, we just need, we just need a, a clip, you know, a keyboard, press the button and do that. Uh, we can find uh, you can find Nick on um, uh, on Instagram at uh, uh, Nick Lyle and on uh, Flickr as Avi Nick A V Y N I C K. I am Graham Homemade Camera on Instagram. I am. Uh, uh, what am I on? Confused. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Freezer of photons. <laughs> Freezer of Photons on Flickr. Um, we also need to thank Robbie Cribs. Robbie Cribs is the really cool dude who made our music. He wrote our the music for us, and he allows us to use this each week or or each fortnight or each whenever. And uh, and he's really uh, cool. You can find Robbie Cribs at SoundtrapStudios.com. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks, Robbie. when I was pushing the crack in a lot, um, the, uh, it, it became kind of a product, uh, you know, that we were, you know, you know, it's homemade cameras, but we were doing products and, yeah. um, uh, and that kind of got me a little bit less excited, uh, because I felt like it wasn't homemade anymore. So we've, we've, um, and, you know, and so I'm happy with you, you know, so there are some people who just want to do what they're, you know, build them for themselves. And right. then there's some people who want to build them and maybe sell them and make a little money on them and stuff like that.
So yeah, no, um, I completely understand. Like I, I follow yeah. Lucas Flander, and you know his cameras right. are fantastic, but they're not really something I can ever try and and, and use, right? Or not easily, right. you, anyway. <laughs> you well, and you 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 can't drop a hundred thousand dollars on one of his cameras because that's what he's putting into them. Right. You know, exactly, if, if you yeah. consider time. And uh, yeah. I was going to mention that when you talked about watches early on, because that's part of Lucas's. Uh, yeah. No, and, no I, uh, I listened to that podcast uh, with Lucas. Yeah. And I, I yeah. recognize a lot of like parallels in terms of interest. <laughs> I mean, right. It's a fine little mechanical mechanism, right? Cameras are timed mechanisms as well. Yeah. There's a lot of similarities. Yeah. Grand Pace watch talk. I always I, want to get into it. I'm a little bit. I'm, I, I'm a little bit bored by the minutia of it, which is what it is, right? Okay. So I, mean, I could but, talk for hours about jewels uh, as pivot points. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 So, so we need to start uh, a separate podcast. <laughs> right. God, yeah. You and Lucas. Well, we we've already got the uh, mechanical pencil podcast lined up. That, uh, <laughs> we're going to be doing. Um, uh, but you know, one of the things that I love about cameras are the machines that they are. You know, if I pick it up and I wind it, I'm getting that all of that feedback and all of that interface with this machine, and they're great or they're crap, you know? I mean, like, this is a Cosina built Vivitar that is plastic and it gives me none of that. But my God, it is, it may, takes beautiful pictures, you know? So, uh, so you know, there, there's photography and, you know, I mean, it's a classic thing. I have two hobbies, cameras and photography, right? Um, this is perfect to take out to shoot. And especially if you don't really, you know, if you're going mud, you know, somewhere where it's muddy or rainy or something like that, because you don't care about it because it was 30 bucks, right? Um, but it's a beautiful camera. It's just not a beautiful, it takes beautiful pictures. It's just not a beautiful machine. And um, and that's that's one of the, you know, I mean, I have an M2 as well, uh, I, and that will never leave my hands. Um, I thought you were going to say it will never leave your house. <laughs> <laughs> never leave my house. Right, exactly. <laughs>